episode 108. Can you focus now? Welcome back to One Extraordinary Marriage, where we talk about life, love, and the pursuit of intimacy. You're here with Elisa DiLorenzo. And Tony DiLorenzo. And welcome back, folks. It's the weekend after Valentine's Day. Some of you may have actually been celebrating Valentine's Day this weekend. And um, for all those of you, you know, happy Valentine's Day. Belated. Belated. And if you didn't, that's fine, yeah, too. You Hopefully you caught our last week's show on where we stand on it. Elisa still and I still haven't. Let me back up there. Elisa and I still have not gone out. We had some sick kids the weekend before when we were supposed to go out. Haven't been able to uh, get out this week, but we are, it's or this past this week, week, but we're going to do it this week. So. And I do have to share real quick going Yo. into, um, just since we're still talking a little bit about Valentine's Day, I was talking with a friend this week and she was sharing what she and her husband um, did for Valentine's Day and what they had started as a tradition in their family. Mm-hmm. And this was, you know, they never liked going out and doing the whole big production on Valentine's Day, you know, dealing with the crowds, the triple priced food, you know, that type of thing. And so what they would do is they would recreate that at home. They would put their kids to bed. They would, you know, they'd go out and they'd buy the good food. They'd buy the lobster and the filet and shrimp cocktail, whatever it was, but they would prepare it at home. Mm -hmm. They would set up a table by their fireplace with the nice linens, the fine china. He would wear his tuxedo from the wedding when they got married and then she would wear a nice gown. They would have this candlelit dinner in the comfort of their own home, she said. And then after that, they would watch Casablanca. And this was their Valentine's tradition mm. that they would do year after year. And it was something that, that she said the first year they did it, it seemed like, wow, this is a lot of work. But then as it became part of their life together, their traditions, it was something that they looked forward to. And it just gave them that t- that opportunity to have that romantic evening just for themselves. Right. So she gave me permission to share that. And so I wanted to... Um, just wanted to give you, you know, that's something you could do for an anniversary or if there's another special day in your relationship, you don't always have to go to a restaurant. Yeah. You know, you, you can, you, you can re- start traditions, start your own. Think, think of something things. that, yeah. Think of something that would work for you guys. For Elisa and I, I think the biggest tradition that we finally started in our marriage came, I think right around our ninth or 10th anniversary is that we make it a priority to get away on every anniversary mm-hmm. now that that has become a tradition in our marriage, something that we didn't do on the earlier years, which is sort of odd because we didn't have kids. It probably would have been easier for us to well, take off. But the thing is we did, but it usually involved a backpack and sleeping in a tent, <laughs> which wasn't which, to Lisa's liking. You know, there's nothing you wrong can hear with it that. in her voice. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just, it's not my image of an anniversary trip. Right. Like I have no problem backpacking. I have no problem sleeping in a tent, but on my anniversary, I want to be pampered. Yes. <laughs> want a little luxury. And, and I'm not even talking about, I mean, I'm not talking like it's got to be, you know, a five, five star, star hotel. I just want to be indoors. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't want, I don't want to be cold on my anniversary. Totally so, understand. That's all. That works. So let's talk about tonight's topic. Unless yeah. you have anything else before, because sometimes I start to jump in and you're not ready to jump in. No, let's go. You're ready to jump in. Yeah. Okay, so I, I want you all to um, imagine that you're sitting in the Di Lorenzo kitchen because I'm going to take you back to earlier this week. Actually, what's been going on here a, a few weeks, and Tony, Tony knows about this. Yeah. He doesn't know I'm going to share it right now, but he just figured that out. So we are all fortunate enough to have breakfast together as a family. Right. So the kids sit down to breakfast. I make breakfast, and Tony sits down at the table with his droid. And instead of being the 1950s dad who has the newspaper up in front of the family so that they can't actually see him, he sits at the table with his droid. Conversations going all around. You know, it's just those of you with kids, you just know that there's always, it's not like you sit down to a quiet breakfast Mm -hmm. with them. There's just a conversation and commotion and we're having interactions. And Tony is sitting at the head of the table with droid. And and usually I'm looking at it just like, if it was like if it was the newspaper, the newspaper. I'm I'm not really checking emails. I'm not looking at Facebook. I'm not doing any of that. Because you've already done that. 
Usually, yeah, that's already been done. That, that's the that as soon as he walks into the kitchen in the morning, he goes straight to his phone. And this is not a slam on Tony. I go straight to my phone too. It's just w- for illustrative purposes. I right. just want you to think, you know, back nineteen fifties, you, you've seen, you know, Leave It to Beaver, where the other or day. heck, nineteen fifties, heck, even when we were growing up, our our dads would do it. Okay, so it's probably been in the last ten years that newspaper. I, I don't know. We haven't had a morning newspaper for a really long time. Uh, we haven't, but I mean, growing up, yeah, there were newspapers in our household. That's true. Okay, but you know, you get that image of dad with the newspaper, and basically, what I'm saying is, replace the newspaper with the phone, with the phone, or the computer, what, or the iPad, or whatever electronic device you are using. We're plugged in, right? And we've talked about being plugged in before, but what we really want to focus in tonight is. Oh, kind of an interesting little pun there. Is what are you focusing on when all of this relational time is happening around you? Yeah. Are you able to focus on the relationships of the human beings that are in your presence as opposed to the electronics that are in your hand? Right. And that's what we're really going to talk about tonight and challenge you because it's come to our attention that there are times when we both fail miserably. At that, where we stop having conversations because whatever electronic notification we've gotten on our phone, on our whatever, seems more important than the human being that is in our room with us right now trying to have a conversation. Yeah, specifically your spouse. Spouse or children. Yeah. Because I, they, I know. they also bear the brunt of that a lot too, where you're like, hold on, mommy's doing this, or, you know, daddy's, you know, I mean, they, they see you. They joke about the fact that yeah, you well, yeah. that you know they're like oh dad's on his phone yeah no, no. and it's it's not it's not a joking matter it's a serious matter and that's why that's why we're bringing it up because we know that if we're doing it we're probably not alone not at all not at all I mean we're we're a very plugged in society and and you know we don't often unplug mm-hmm. we go on vacation we take our electronics we. I mean, the best vacation we took, I think, was last year when we went to Puerto Rico and the cell, the computer stayed home. My phone stayed in the hotel um, room in the safe. We didn't pull it out. And we only than, used, yeah, we only used my cell phone because we recorded with all the other friends that we had there just to meet up. You know, it was like the yeah. meetup phone. Um, but that was that was it, and it was really nice to do that to just unplug. And, and one of the reasons this is coming up because we're hearing it. From a lot of you guys, I mean, you got to understand, we get emails from you guys. We don't read them all. A lot of them are just too personal, and we, we just don't read them. And we... We don't read them on the air. We do read all of them. Yes. Yeah. That's... Thank you for the clarification. We, we don't read them on the air. And we're, we're noticing that between... Elise and I really have come to realize over these last couple of years, there's two areas that we really enjoy talking about. Sex, because we love it, and communication, because I really enjoy it but i have learned communication has been a huge factor in our marriage over the last four years ever since we started the 60 days of sex challenge or we started intimacy ignited that small group Mm -hmm. the communication in our marriage has increased steadily over the last four years and i would actually even go so far as to say it's not so much that the quantity of communication has increased as the quality Right. Has really yeah. increased. You know, it's not like I'm talking more, although there are times when he probably feels like I'm talking more. But we're able to connect on a different level. Mm-hmm. You know, for example, you know, we have Alex is involved in baseball. This was something that just happened yesterday. Right. Alex is involved in baseball. Saturday, he's got practice. Tony was going to a writing workshop in the morning. And can I expand on the writing workshop? Yeah. Okay. And the reason I'm going to this writing workshop is Elise and I, after going to Michigan and doing, um, leading that marriage conference out there, we have just felt that the Lord is just telling us to go off and start doing more of these conferences. And we both believe that when we talk about sex in a very safe place to Christians, and you guys have heard us talk about this many a times. It's nothing new. You can pick up our book at oneextraordinarymarriage.com. You'll see what we talk about when we talk about sexual intimacy. But when we're able to talk about it to Christians in a way that is safe, it's amazing. We're getting feedback from that conference, and it's just awesome. Mm-hmm. So we really feel that the Lord is leading us this way. 
I personally need a lot of help when it comes to my creative side at times because I get more of the thinking into the business side of stuff. And the writing, this was a poetry course that was even held at our church. And the woman who was putting it on, a, a dear friend of ours who was in our strip down small group last summer, she was helping us sort of get the whole idea of what this conference is going to look like and helping us um, sort of play, not what's the word? She's helping us narrow our focus. I mean, yeah, narrow our fo- yeah, narrow our focus. Create, but it, it's really to create the presentation. The presentation. So th- that's why I was there for that. Okay. They're probably wondering now if we can focus. If we can. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and if I sound a little off, it's just I am. It's it's a Sunday. It has actually been a really lazy Sunday for us. We've chilled a lot. I mean, I've taken a nap or two today. It, it's just been a lazy Sunday, and and I'm all for it. I've just been reading my book and checking, you know, on the kids okay. and dealing with them. For Come a back bit. to me. Yes. Come back to me. I'm back. They don't necessarily care what you're doing today. All right. So, <laughs> I'm just being honest. Thank you. So. But we had, we had, you know, Tony was at the writing workshop that was supposed to get over at 1130. Alex had practice at 12. I was doing a jewelry party that I needed to leave at two. So there were all of these kind of like back to back time commitments. And we had a miscommunication. I thought, you know, when Tony told me it was over at 1130 and he was going to meet Alex at the park for practice. And I said I was going to drop, I said I was going to drop Alex off there. Well, I thought Tony was going to be there about noonish. Mm -hmm. And so at 1230, I'm sending Tony these texts going, I'm worried. Where are you? Are, are you coming? Because I'm still here with our kid and I, I need to get on to the next thing on my day. And he calls. He's like, hey, what are you still doing at the park? And I'm like, I'm waiting for you to show up. You're like, where are you? And you, you want to talk about those kinds of words that can diffuse a situation really quick? He's like, honey, we had a miscommunication. Boom. Okay. Diffuse the anger. Because he's calling it what it is, not like he's making up all these excuses and doing all this kind of stuff. Honey, you know, we had a miscommunication. And I can guarantee you five years ago, that's not the conversation we would have had. Oh, no, not at all. You would have been like, why are you calling me? Yeah. You know, I told you I'd get there. What, it's your problem if you haven't left yet type of thing. And then it's like, babe, it ran a little over. I was talking to a friend who's helping us out. I thought you were just dropping Alex off. Boom. Diffused. And that's the kind of thing when you, when you make the communication a focus of your relationship and you start focusing on the conversation that you are having, whether it's across the phone or with the person across the table from you or if it's the person that's next to you in the bed, your spouse next to you in the bed, not a person, the one you're married to. Um, when you start focusing on that communication, it takes your relationship to a whole nother level, but you've got to put the investment into that, into being focused on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the exercises we did at this workshop was they asked us to take 30 minutes and write our poem. Now I'm not a poet by any stretch of the imagination. I just sort of went along with what they were saying, but 30 minutes of silence, just writing your poem. Wow, can I say how hard that was for me? Because I am constantly, there's things going on and I'm shifting my attention. And I think I'm coming to the realization that multitasking is a bunch of crap. I mean, I got more done in 30 minutes writing that poem than I think I've done in a long time. And it's one of those things that I'm gonna start working on in my own life is, you know what? take away all this multitasking. I don't know why it keeps coming up that we need to be great multitaskers. I'm thinking I need to be just a singular tasker, Mm -hmm. which is work on one thing really good. And in the context of what we're talking about here, that's really paying attention to my wife in conversation and not having the distractions. So it may mean that Elisa and I go, hey, for 30 minutes, we're going to talk about X, Y, Z. And, you know, the TV gets turned off. The computers get shut down. The phones get put away. And if it means we got to put on a timer so we can stay in that time, then we put the timer on, but we focus on each other. And this is not an easy thing for us. No, 
No, no, I mean, no, it's not. You know, it's like I, I, I was inviting you into our kitchen and, and talking about Tony, but, uh, you know, we're both very plugged in individuals. And I know a lot of you are too. You know, I'm friends with a lot of you. I see your posts on Facebook. You post as much as I do. You're a little bit plugged in. Mm. You know, we lose a little bit of the relational quality though when it's all about the electronics. Right. And, you know, some of those, some of the biggest things that will happen in your marriage over time is when that communication breaks down. And like Elisa said, the incident that happened on Saturday, if, if it would have been five years ago, uh, there would have been words spoken that would not have been nice. We would have been angry at each other. She would have gone off and done her show. I would have been upset because I'm hanging here with the kids or a number of things would have happened. But instead, I just rolled up to the school. She was still there. We did a quick exchange with Abby and some of her stuff. You know, we gave each other kisses and it was just like, all right, cool. And it, it was a done deal. I mean, within five minutes, it was it was over. I was at the ballpark at the diamond with Alex watching him. Abby was doing her thing and I didn't give it much more thought. And the only reason it comes up today is to share with all of you what happens when you put that focus back on people, Mm -hmm. how that changes your relationships. Because I know, I, I know when he called yesterday and he was just like, I totally thought something else was like, I, I thought we'd been on a different page. Mm -hmm. And, and so where, where is the purpose in me keeping my anger when he has been so forthright to say, well, totally, totally on a different page, honey. Yeah. You know, and it's okay. And so it takes that emotion, that negative emotion out of the relationship. And we can just focus on moving forward because so often when our communication breaks down, when we're focused on, you know, who sent me an email or who posted on Facebook or, you know, who, tweeted me or who left me a voicemail or and, and don't get me wrong there are times when i'm talking to elisa and i'll have to like snap my finger and i'll have to grab her attention because i know she's not listening to me and i'm like turn the computer off yeah turn turn my way look at me so i see your eyes so we can converse here so it, it, it goes both ways yeah it goes both ways and and you know, I know I'm just as guilty as Tony is. It was just a very visual example. And, <laughs> and I actually, we sat down to lunch. Was it, when did we sit down that I took the phone away from you? Lunch? Maybe it was breakfast. Maybe it was breakfast the day after. This was like a Wednesday thing. And it was like Thursday. But he comes to the table and he's got his phone. And the kids are sitting there. And I, I literally just yeah. picked up the phone and I moved it away. Yeah. And like, no, you're actually going to sit here and talk. Yeah, you're going to sit and talk to us. Yeah. But But what we're finding is, you know, for ourselves and for our kids, um, I know we shared with you guys that a weekend, not this past weekend, but the weekend before, they lost all their TV privileges, all their electronics, they lost everything for a weekend because Friday night had just been horrendous. And what it forced us to do was to have a lot more interaction with each other mm -hmm. and to start doing more of those types of things that I know some of you have done really well in terms of your communication and, and your, you know, playing games and things like that. But we, I think a lot of relationships, a lot of families kind of ebb and flow yeah. as far as working on that. And so what we want to do is we want to bring this back to the, to the forefront again, say, okay, you know what? We, some of us might be guilty of doing this. Some of us might've lost the focus on the people and we're a little more focused on the gadgets and whatnot. Let's mm -hmm. let's bring that focus back to the people in our lives. Let's, yeah. Let's remind ourselves that the people are number one. That's, you know, it's not going to matter in 50 years if you tweeted something in, in this 30 seconds. Your Facebook friends are not going to remember what you posted today. But your husband's going to remember if you looked in his eyes when he was talking to you. Your kids are going to remember if you closed the computer to have a conversation with them. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where your legacy is. It's in how you made those people feel. Because trust me, I, I couldn't tell you what Tony tweeted the last time he tweeted. Um, I don't think I can either. <laughs> exactly. But at, at the moment, you know, I, I know I'm not alone when I say when I'm putting something up on Facebook or tweeting or, you know, checking the voicemail, it seems like it's the most important thing in the world. Really? If it waited an extra 10 minutes, would the world end? Probably not. Mm-hmm. But sometimes in my warped perception of things, I think that it's, it's an emergency. 
Right. It's not an emergency. And, and for some of you, you guys might be thinking, it's like, man, every time we try to have a conversation, it turns into a fight and we're not, we're just not connecting there. And, and so you're sort of listening to us right now and you're just getting all sweaty because you're just like, ah, you know, I've tried that. I've tried to talk to him or her about what's going on right now. And maybe an exercise you can do instead of trying to deal with what's going on now, there's a couple exercises I think you can do. One is talk about your past. Mm. Look back and talk about the things that have happened in your marriage, in your past and try to dig deep. I mean, Elisa and I were, were even doing this a couple nights ago because we want to put up a post here in a little while. Um, but you know, what happened in your marriage way back when? And I mean, Elisa and I were digging deep into our memory banks of, you know, places we lived and people we knew and jobs and we're sort of laughing and wow, how did that really work out there? And so it allowed us not to really look at the present, which I know is important. I do know it's important, but for some of you talking about the hurts of the present is just going to erupt into a fight, which is going to lead you to nowhere. So maybe look back in time and look at those good things that have happened and try to dig deep into those, you know, try to really rack your memory bank because for Elise and I, it took us a little while and we were just like, Oh man, do you remember that? Which led to this, to this, to that. And we had a fun time. It it was probably a good half an hour of us just chit chatting like that. The other thing is take some time to just write. If you guys can, you know, maybe words aren't spoken, but maybe there's a topic that you guys want to want to help each other with or get through. And instead of trying to talk about it because there may be some just vocal or voice inflections that can cause the other partner to get upset and frustrated, maybe write that stuff down and then pass it to each other. So you guys can read it and then talk about it. I know these are hard. Marriage didn't come with an easy dealio, you know, an easy button. Button. Yeah, this didn't come with an easy button. And there are times when you have to work through some of the tough stuff to get to the good stuff. And Elise and I are a testament to that. I mean, if there's a marriage that has gone through crap, has come through, and to this day, I mean, I was telling a woman Saturday that the last four years have been the best of my marriage. And right now I love Elisa more than I've ever loved her. And so the tough stuff that we had to go through wasn't easy and it wasn't fun, not by any means. And some of you guys have heard some of the tough stuff that we've gone through in the last two years here on this podcast. You've heard some of the the frustrations that we've had with each other on this podcast and how we've worked through them to get to where we are today. So for you, for those of you who are just like, oh, I just don't want to do that. I mean, look, look back, look back, see, see, see the good stuff or sit down, write a love note to each other. You know, and this isn't some deal that, hey, you do once a year and eh, whatever it's it's a, it's at a retreat. Now these are things you got to do daily, weekly, monthly. Somehow some way you need to be paying attention. You have to be understanding and seeing the cues that your spouse is giving off and start to understand what why that is happening. And there are some of us that will shut down. Elisa used to be a great shutdown person. So I I know this as a spouse of someone who has dealt with it, how hard it used to be and how angry I used to get and how frustrated I would be when we would start talking about something just because she felt like it wasn't did it wasn't deemed worthy or she didn't want to engage in the conversation, she would just stop talking. And it would just infuriate me. And I would just badger her. And a lot of the way we really got through it is that we would just take little snippets of time. When things are going good, we would try to talk about stuff that was pertinent to our marriage at that time that wasn't going to lead us down some rabbit hole and get upset with each other. And that's part of it. I mean, sometimes you, you know, there's a lot to be said for 
when things are going well, having some of those difficult conversations and it's not, it's not like, well, great. Now, now you're telling me things are going well. So now you want me to rock the boat and, and you know, shake things up. No, what I want you to do is take advantage of those times when things are on an even keel to say, you know what, can we just talk about this Mm -hmm. and just pull apart whatever the big issue is and find a little piece of it. And, and when you're finding yourselves in that conversation, agree to play fair, you know, set up your rules of engagement prior to the conversation. You know, there's a great, um, there's a great section in the book, Love Dare, where it ta- one of the days talks about rules of engagement. How are you going to resolve your issues? How are you going to fight fair? You know, I, I, I was the queen of unfair fighting. Because like Tony said, if I didn't like it, too bad. I'm not talking about it. And I'm about as stubborn as they come. I come from a long line of stubborn. And um, the silent treatment, I have that perfected and so i did not fight fair tony wanted to talk about something we had an issue in our marriage too bad wait until it blows over because i'm not talking about it mm-hmm. yep boom shut you off well great what does that do for my marriage absolutely nothing but start tearing it down brick mm-hmm. by brick and so when we were able to work through that and it was not an easy process I don't know how many times I had to be called to task for, you know, I'd get the, you're doing it again. You need to stay engaged with me. I mean, that would be the lines that he would use. You're shutting me out. I need you to talk through some of this with me. And maybe we didn't tackle the whole big issue. Mm -hmm. Because I had to learn. For me, it was a matter of learning how to confront issues without feeling like I was going to get shut down without feeling like I was going to get badgered. It was, okay, how do we play grown up and actually have a discussion over whatever the issue was? And here's the thing. When it comes to communication, there's loads of books uh, and you can read many different books. You're going to find your style. Mm -hmm. You're going to find your style. There, there, there isn't a book out there that talked about the way Elise and I engaged each other in our (laughs) communication style. It just wasn't out there. I, I remember reading a number of books and I'm getting even more now because I do enjoy the, the communication aspect of our marriage more and more and how we are able to communicate and hopefully be able to give you guys some more resources as well. But the big thing is that you got to be able to start figuring out what you guys are doing. Mm-hmm. You know, what is that? You know, look at it. Um, dissect the conversations and why is it happening? Just like Elisa said, you know, we had certain key words that we knew so that way it would sort of trigger, okay, I am doing that again. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like I was telling her that to belittle her or anything, but I just, it was sort of like that little chime going off or that little alarm going off so she could realize, okay, I'm doing this again. And the same for me, I had to realize in my own self is that, you know, I would get upset and angry and I would just have to go, okay, why am I getting this way? Mm-hmm. What's happening here? You know, cool off. It's taken a lot of time. It's taken a lot of time on my part in just realizing what is triggering me and why I'm acting the way I'm acting and how to control that. And don't get me wrong, there are times when it still comes out. I mean, heck, last Friday night, Everybody was upset at everybody, and and you know my anger and my tone of voice went up, you know, because it just just all was let loose. And Mama Bear stepped in and shoved Papa Bear out of the way and said, "Go cool off, mm-hmm. go cool off. You you've crossed the line." And 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 that's that is that is a known word in our family. It when she says that to me, it's like. Whoa, I just blew it, and I'm not going to go attacking her. I'm not going to go attack Elisa for saying that. She is saying that because she she's in the right frame of mind, and I'm not, and I do need to just cool off. I need to disengage from what's happening. I need to walk away and come back later. And so that that is a big word that Elisa has used many times on me. And, and and what those code words do in your marriage 
is it allows you, you know, very much like what we're talking about tonight, it allows you to refocus. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we get so wrapped up in a situation, so wrapped up in all the emotion of a situation that we lose focus on, on what's going on. And so if our emotions, especially those negative ones, are out of control, having code words in your family it's very much like Tony said, it's like that bell that goes off the, you know, the, the scientific bells that go off and they're like, ding. Oh yeah. I'm not supposed to do this mm -hmm. because we're human. We're imperfect. We are going to make mistakes. But when you create this loving framework where you've built and worked on the relationships in your family, then hearing those code words, it, it's not a slap in the face. It's the wake up call that says, okay, hold on, hold on. I, I'm crossing a line. I'm doing something I'm not supposed to be doing. Let me figure out what that is. Right. And so when you put the focus back on people, when you focus on the relationships within your four walls that you call your home, then it allows you to build that up and strengthen it so that you're not threatened when your spouse throws out a code word. You're like, oh, okay. There are other things going on here. I need to figure out what's going on in my life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I need to take care of, I need to take care of my family. I need to take care of my kids. I mean, we're, um, I don't know if we shared with you guys, but we are leading a group at our church. We're going through the not a fan series series. And, um, we should put a link to that up on the website. Sure. And the book. Yeah. We, okay. we can put that. It just, it's one that we had heard about, um, actually through Samantha Pryor. She's the first one that mentioned it to us. Uh, mm -hmm. A few months ago that she was doing it at her church. She's a longtime listener and um, she'd encourage us to take a look at it. And then shortly after that, we found out that our church was going to be doing a church wide study. I'm not a fan. And um, we volunteered to lead a Sunday afternoon group that is actually made up of about 65 people. It's a large, small group or a small. Yeah, <laughs> it's a lot of people, but, um, you know, the, the amazing thing about this is that as we're going through these weekly DVDs together and, and questions and whatnot, you know, we're really digging into what it means to follow Jesus, to have our focus on him. And, you know, just, just like Jesus wants us to be all in for him, we need to do the same thing for our spouses and our families. We need to commit to them with that same level of passion, of drive, you know, to look at them and say, you know what, I'm in. Mm -hmm. I'm in. I'm not going to let this other stuff, be it work, be it electronics, be it sports, be it shopping, be it whatever it is. I'm not going to let that stuff distract me from you. Because in the end, that stuff is just stuff. You need to be able to focus on the people in your life, life lives, because that's where your legacy is going to be. Your legacy is going to be the relationships that you have built up through your marriage, through your kids, through your grandkids. That's your legacy. It's, yeah. it's how you influence the people and how you build them up, how you encourage them. The rest of it, the rest of it's just the rest of it. Yeah, and you know, as, as you grow in your communication, and, you know, last year was a tough year for us in the sense of, you know, the main business is down. We're short selling our house. You would think at times like, wow, you know, that's some, some pretty heavy stuff, you know. Income has decreased, losing the house, um, trying to figure out how to, to generate revenues. For myself as a male, you know what? I have felt more at peace than I have in a long time. And I owe it all to just being able to tell Lisa what's going on and not ever feeling like she's going to judge me, belittle me, um, take me down. You know, we just, we just sit together and we go, okay, what, what do we need to do? There, there's no use in fighting. There's no use in arguing with each other about it. Let's, let's team up. We're a team. Let's work together. And so we'll talk through this stuff and it's, Man, is it just enjoyable as a husband to be in a conversation with your wife about this stuff and not worry ever about her just taking me down, you know? Well, I mean, the reality is, is that we only have so much energy in life. 
I mean, you know, God has blessed each one of us with the same 24 hours a day. And I don't even know how many minutes that is, but we've all got the same amount of time. That's what it boils down to. So how do you want to spend that time? Do you want to spend it fighting and in friction and confrontation? Or do you want to spend it working together to work through whatever the issues are? Mm -hmm. And that's not to say we don't have our disagreements. We don't have those times when we're, you know, butting heads or, or that type of thing. But that's not how I want to spend my time. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I want to spend my time getting over those hurdles so that we can move on to, to the more even keel stuff. And don't forget, folks. I mean, if you're at a point where it is at an impasse, it is very difficult to talk at all. Mm -hmm. Always, we, and we have said this many times before, find a third party, find a counselor, be it at your church or somebody else, interview them, find out if you can get in there. If only one of you wants to make it happen, then one of you makes it happen. You know, you start growing up. This is the thing, folks. We are adults. So start growing up. And your spouse will hopefully come alongside and go, wow, I see the changes that you are having. I want to be where you are. Mm -hmm. You need to lead. Don't just sit there and do nothing. And I, I want to refer you guys to a great program that our, our friend Dr. Corey Allen puts on. It's called Blow Up My Marriage. He has had many couples, many of them who've been one listeners, have gone there. Couples have gone through it. Folks, you know, their spouse doesn't want to go through it, but they're going through it, and they are seeing impact and change happening. So don't always just sit there. If nothing is going on, you've got to make change happen. And so don't be afraid to seek out counsel. Take a course. It's worth it. One of my biggest pet peeves with people when it comes to their marriage, as soon as you add a monetary value to something, like you tell them, hey, to go through co coaching with us, it'll cost $350. Ooh, that's a lot of money. I'm talking about your marriage here. 350 bucks is a drop in the bucket if you have to get an attorney to get into a divorce and the emotional ramifications and all the other junk that comes with it. And I understand times are tough. I do. I feel it. My family feels it. We understand. But 350 bucks, 400 bucks to save my marriage or help myself grow so I can be better is well worth the money spent. So think, think before you make rational decisions and go, it's too much money. Because I bet you, you spend that much money going out to eat every month. $400 is a lot of money to eat out. Oh, there are people I know who go out five to six times a week at 10 bucks a pop. Okay. All right. So there you okay. go. That would be a lot of money for us to spend eating out. I, I understand okay. that. But I, I see it on the fit marriage side of things when people write to me and tell me, wow, you know what? My biggest my biggest problem is that I eat crappy. Okay. Okay. Well, how many times are you going out? You know, and Got it. it. There you go. There's your money and there's there's why your your waste is expanding. Got it. Yeah, I, I, folks, it all, it all comes down to decisions. And, and, you know, we've shared this with you before. I mean, your marriage is a decision that you made. So every day you have a choice as to how you're going to live out your marriage. Mm -hmm. Are you going to build it up or are you going to tear it down? Are you going to focus on what matters or are you going to focus on the trivial things? You know, are you going to, you know, things from friend people on Facebook you shouldn't be friending to taking that phone call you shouldn't be taking to having lunch with that colleague that, you, you know, what, what choices are you going to make today? Are you going to surround yourself with people that build up marriage? Or are you going to surround yourself with those friends that tear down marriage? You have choices to make. And so we're just challenging you to make the choices that are going to build up your marriage. Mm -hmm. To make the decision today that you're going to sit down with your spouse and have that conversation. Or you're going to put the phone away or you're not going to answer email. You know, I, we've got one um, family, friends of ours. They don't do electronics between when dad comes home from dinner and their child goes to bed. Mm -hmm. 
No electron. That means no TV, no computer, no phone, no nothing. So that when dad comes home from work, it is family time. Maybe that's what, you know, what works in your family. I would love to know what you guys are doing to, you know, you can respond, you know, in the comments below. Tell us how you're doing this. Tell us how you're maintaining the focus. And those uh, comments below are at one extraordinary marriage.com. Thank you. Um, tell us how you maintain the focus on relationships in your family, in your marriage. Mm-hmm. Tell us what's worked for you. Because one of the greatest things is, you know, I love seeing the exchange of ideas, whether it's on the comment page there at oneextraordinarymarriage.com or on our Facebook fan page where conversation starts going about what people are doing and how it triggers something for somebody else to say, oh, I hadn't thought about that. Mm -hmm. Hadn't thought about that. Now, maybe, maybe we do turn off electronics between five and eight. Or, you know, we don't turn the phone on until we're driving to work in the morning, whatever it is. Share with us what's working for you because I want to know what you guys are doing to build up the relationships that matter most to you. I want to know. Yeah. Awesome. A little bit of business. If we can ask for some prayer from you guys, Elisa and I are looking to start another show called the Strip Down Show. And our whole goal with the Strip Down Show, though, is that it's going to be all about sexual intimacy and it's going to be a call and talk show. And we've submitted an application with crimin, uh, crimin, Christian. <laughs> I am off tonight. Wow, where are you going with that one? I don't know. Christian Women's Affiliate, and they're on Blog Talk Radio. It's just they have a big network. So we've submitted our application there. So we just pray that we get uh, accepted and we can be a part of them because it, they got a, a great um showing of, of other podcasts and other folks that are, are sharing to Christian women and men. And part of the reason for this is it's becoming very obvious to us. The more we speak, um, the more interaction we have with folks is that this piece on sexual intimacy is just not being talked about Mm -hmm. and it's not being talked about by a couple who is married and still having sex. Right. You know, you, you have a lot of a lot of wonderful speakers out there who are presenting the information singularly. They're married, but the information comes just from one side of the relationship. Um, and so, you know, we hear time and time again, wow, you guys are like a couple talking about sex, um, which to us just seems normal because that's the way we've been doing it. But th- there's a real need mm-hmm. for couples to talk about sex in a in a constructive way and we want to be that voice we want to be a safe place a constructive place to talk about sex in your marriage and and to build up sexual intimacy in marriages right because there's a real there's a real disconnect going on right now for folks that this piece is missing out of so many marriages and so that that's kind of why you know when tony's like well that's the focus of the show that's why yeah, and, and that's why. And we want it to be a talk show. We don't want it to be a monologue between Lisa and I. We have one extraordinary marriage, and we're not going to give this this up because we just love it. It is, you know, it's what we've been talking about this whole show: taking time, talking to your spouse. This is this is mine and Lisa's time every week. You know, this is our time to sit and talk to each other, and ideas come up, and and we we volley back and forth, and we love it. With the new show, it's it's going to be a call in. We want people to interact with us more. We we really and truly love you guys. I I don't know how else to say it other than when I see you, and I can hold you and I can hug you and tell you we love you because we do. Elisa and I are very relational type people. We love being around people. We get energized around you. We love just just being by you and hearing about what's going on in your marriage. It's just what it's just what it is. So. The new show, we hope that it gets accepted. It'll be a live call-in show, and so we can get some really good interaction. We can get some talk going on between us. So just pray for that. Other than that, we got some other stuff coming up here with the One Extraordinary Marriage, and we're going to just keep cranking along. We love you guys for all you've done over the years in supporting us and cheering us on and being fans on Facebook and responding to us and letting us know how we can pray for you and, and what you do in your marriage. It's... 
it means a ton to us. It means a ton to us when we can go out and we can talk to other people and we can share what you're doing and how the One Extraordinary Marriage Show has impacted your marriage because they get it, they sense it, and they come on over and they start seeing how they can make an impact, how this show can make an impact on their marriage. So with that, we love you guys. We hope you have a fantastic week. And if you need to get us a hold of us, 858 (laughs) 8765663 or info at one extraordinary marriage will get a hold of either Elisa or I. All right. Peace out. We love you. <laughs>